thanks. Thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me to this interesting meeting. And let's be provocative. I would like to propose an interesting hypothesis, right? Could we sepsis patients be predisposed to sepsis based on previous endothelial dysfunction? So let's try to discuss some base. So these are my conflicts of interest. And uh, you know that in the new definition of sepsis, uh, organ dysfunction is just in the center of the definition and it's in the spotlight, right? So the interaction between the immune system and the endothelium is key to understand the uh, physiopathology of organ dysfunction in sepsis. So our group is devoted to understand the interactions between the leukocytes and the endothelium and the housing response in the endothelium, right? So I will discuss on endothelial injury in sepsis very briefly because it has been already discussed here. And you know that the endothelium is composed by endothelial cells and the device of lamina and the glycocalyx, which prevents binding of uh, erythrocytes and platelets to the, to the endothelium and keeps every, every cell circulating. And it's a specialized barrier for you know, distributing uh, solutes and cells between the intravascular and intravascular space. There are three different kind of uh, junctions uh, uh, keeping together the cells, which are specialized unions called tight junctions, gap, and other junctions. And what happened in sepsis, what you probably know, that there is an increase in vascular permeability uh, leading to tissue edema and uh, there is an activation of coagulation. And as I already said, it compromised perfusion of organs leading to organ failure. In the right bottom side of the slide, you will see this graphic showing a normal uh, barrier, a uh, preserved endothelial cell union, and in the left side you will find uh, a disrupted endothelial union with vascular leakage. So let's go directly to my point. Uh, so we pay attention to epidemiology of sepsis. I like a lot of epidemiology. <laughs> you can learn a lot from it, right? So uh, in this interesting paper from the CDC, they, they made two different uh, important conclusions. 80% of the cases of sepsis, they start in the community, and sepsis occurs in people with comorbidities, right? So sepsis is not, generally speaking, a disease of healthy people. It's uh, a disease of people and aged people with comorbidities. In this report, they demonstrated that 90% of the patients living in the community uh, they, and suffering from sepsis, they had at least one comorbidity. These two recent reports, uh, this, these are the two largest epidemiological reports um, on sepsis epidemiology uh, using the new sepsis 3 criteria, right? So. Uh, so they investigate the prevalence of comorbidities in sepsis and you will find a very similar profile in the two different studies published in JAMA and Lancet. So and they, they recruit thousands of patients, or they, they study thousands of patients and the profile of comorbidities are very similar, as I already said. Uh, common comorbidities like diabetes, chronic renal disease, etc. Right? So we think that if you already have chronic uh, chronic disease before sepsis, and you know, everybody knows that chronic diseases are associated to endothelial dysfunction. Could, it, could the sepsis patients be predisposed to sepsis based on the previous endothelial uh, dysfunction? So we review it, uh, the available literature on endothelial dysfunction and each one of these diseases, and we came with five major features. That which are common between endothelial dysfunction in sepsis, aging, and chronic disease. So the first one was the presence of an increased oxidative stress and systemic inflammation. Next, the second one would be glycocalyx degradation. And the third one would be that is the destruction of intercellular unions. And the fourth could be the increased uh, presence of leukocyte addition and destruction. And finally, the induction of coagulation phenomena. So these chronic diseases and aging and sepsis share these features. So I will try to model these features in the next slides. So this pertains to be a healthy endothelium. So 
uh, I, I say pretends to be because you know you see there the Glico calyx uh, protecting the endothelium from flotation, cells circulating normally with no problems, the, the cell junctions are preserved, and the endothelial cells are, are healthy, right? But on the left side, we model what happened in chronic disease and aging individuals. So you will see a certain degree of glucocalic detachment, a certain degree of um, disassembly of subjunctions, cell apoptosis, uh, chronic in, in pro-inflammatory environment, nitrocyte stress, chronic procoagulant phenomenon, and uh, increased addition of the cells, leukocytes to the endothelium. So, and on top of this, the cells who, who are, which are in charge of repairing the endothelium, which are endothelial progenitor cells, are not working properly. So if you have diabetes or you have hypertension, your endothelial progenitor cells are not going to work uh, as, as supposed. So, and what happens in this scenario of endothelial frailty if the individual gets infected? So, when an individual with a chronic disease faces an infection, <laughs> in the right part, for sure, is an hypothesis. So, what we think that is happening is that all gets worse. So you will have more disruption of intercellular cell unions, more apoptosis, and increased elevation of glucosides to a, a endothelium with a detached uh, glucocalyx, and more procoagulant phenomenon, and more leakage of fluids and cells to the extravascular space, right? So at the end of the day, sepsis will be the resultant of uh, different factors, like your previous chronic immunological population metabolic factors, uh, alterations, uh, your previous endothelial frailty, and the acute endothelial dysfunction induced by uh, trauma, surgery, uh, liquids, uh, and the bacterial toxins, for example. Right. So, is there any evidence on the sixth time of this endothelial frailty predisposing to sepsis? So, it's not that much, but there's some. So, this is a marvelous work coming from the Rudat's cohort, which is a epi study in the United States. And so, these guys studied the incidence of stroke in a cohort of uh, patients living in the community. So they made work of the data and reanalyzed the data for evaluating the incidence of sepsis in the, in the individuals with comorbidities. And you will observe here that the presence of comorbidities increase your risk of developing sepsis afterwards. In early, you know that all these diseases goes with uh, between other things and ophelial dysfunction. But more interestingly, the same group they provide in markers of endothelial dysfunction in a small subset of these patients. So they had, they had preserved frozen plasma from these patients, and they provided interleukin-6 and endothelial markers, markers of endothelial dysfunction. So, and they observed that they found a close or a, a, a significant association between elevated levels of interleukin-6, isolactin, and IGN-1, and the risk of further sepsis uh, at the long term, right? So this is kind of evidence that the more endothelial dysfunction you have uh, in the community, the more probability is that you would have sepsis. So this is a study coming from a group from Romania, published in cytokine, and they would provide the endothelial dysfunction at the entry to the ICU with no sepsis. So they are critical in patients with no sepsis. So they provide biomarkers at uh, ICU admission, and they observed that the more endothelial dysfunction you have at ICU admission, the more probability it is to develop sepsis afterwards. So is it worth in monitoring endothelial dysfunction at the entry of the ICU? So probably yes, right? So in addition to the biophysical and methods, there are a number of biomarkers that could help us to provide endothelial dysfunction. A lot of them come from the experience of cardiovascular diseases, renal diseases, chronic diseases, you are speaking, right? But I want to, to bring your attention to a particular biomarker, which is mid-regional proadrenomedaly. So this is a kind of pre-pro-hormone, it's a, a stable part of adrenomedaly. Uh, so it's very interesting, it reflects aggression to the endothelium and uh, 
it's supposed to possess a protective role in sepsis. So we have demonstrated in the past that a prior modeling is able to perfectly distinguish survivors from non-survivors in sepsis in this paper that we published in Annals of Intensive Care. And there is an ongoing clinical trial uh, proposing an antibody blocking adrenomedaline to preserve adrenomedaline inside the, 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 the blood vessels uh, in order to keep on going with their protective activity. And there are another kind of biomarkers that could be useful, as already been said here, these are data coming from our group, and as you can see here, neutrophil proteases are increasing in the infection with organ failure. So you will find here a group of healthy controls, infections such as anxiety shock. So the more severe you are, the more degree of expression, gene expression of neutrophil proteases like lipocalin 2, MMP8, and lactoferrin. So the burden of neutrophil proteases is increasing with, uh, with organ failure, but it it's interesting that it parallels the increase in endothelial dysfunction. So I don't really hear the correlations, but there is a nice correlation between the previous slide and this one, which is the biomarkers of endothelial dysfunction, some of them have already been mentioned here, pro-ADM, angiopoietin 2, thromomodulin, and syndicate 1. So we have damage in the different levels of the endothelium, glycocalyx, uh, solar level, and uh, also in the junctions, I, I didn't bring th this data, but there is a correlation between metalloprotein assets levels and endothelial dysfunction. So these are nice biomarkers that could be used to provide endothelial dysfunction and admission to ICU in the future. So in conclusion, so we have reviewed all the available evidence on sepsis, aging, and chronic disease, and we find similar features of endothelial dysfunction between these different conditions. So probably this drops on a scenario or of endothelial frailty present in sepsis. So next question could be, could, if we monitor endothelial frailty, could we predict who is going to develop sepsis? And if we early identify endothelial dysfunction in an infection, could, could we early identify sepsis? And what about the treatment? Could we prevent sepsis by improving endothelial dysfunction? And for sure, you know, on the studies administrating C vitamin, hydrocortisone, and thiamine to treat sepsis, uh, targeting the endothelium, right? So to me, this is a new avenue for. Why not preventing sepsis in the future? In fact, the, work, the group the, of the Gulags cohort published a paper in Critical Repair saying sepsis is a preventable, pre preventable disease, right? You can improve endothelial dysfunction to improve sepsis. It's a lot to do with epidemiology, but um, I think it's an exciting new topic. We published these reflections in the Journal of Clinical Medicine last year. So if you are interested in entering into details, we have elaborated more on this idea and this review. And I want to finish uh, thanking all the people working in the surgical and medical ICUs in Castilla León, Valladolid, in Hospital Clínico Universitario de Valladolid, Hospital de Ortega, and Hospital Clínico de Salamanca. So we have been working together in the last 10 years doing research on sepsis in the biosepsis group. This is my contact and we will be more than happy to receive any questions or suggestions. Thanks so much.